Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Earlier this week, as you doubtless saw, Kathy Griffin released a video of herself posing with a bloody mannequin head made up to look like President Trump. Well, as comedy, it failed completely. Nobody thought it was funny. As performance art, it was lame, least creative stunt of the week by far. As a political statement, it didn't even make any sense. But it did have the effect of briefly making Griffin famous again. And of course, that was likely the whole point. Today, Griffin elbowed her way back into the news cycle, holding a press conference with celebrity misery chaser Lisa Bloom. Here's part of what she said. Image that I participated in, that apology absolutely stands. I feel horrible. I have performed in war zones. The idea that this, you know, uh, made people think of this tragedy, to have been touched by this tragedy, is, is horrifying and it's horrible. Uh, trust me, if I could redo the whole thing, I would have had a blow-up doll and no ketchup. I am going to make fun of the president. And you know what? I'm going to make fun of him more now. More. I'm not afraid of Donald Trump. He's a bully. I've dealt with older white guys trying to keep me down my whole life, my whole career. I just wanted to say, you know, if you don't stand up, you get run over. And what's happening to me has never happened ever in the history of this great country, which is that a sitting president of the United States and his grown children and the first lady are personally, I feel personally, trying to ruin my life forever. This is America and you shouldn't have to die for it. The death threats that I'm getting are constant and they are detailed and they are serious and they are specific. And today it's me and tomorrow it could be you. I don't think I will have a career after this. I think he, I think he, I think he, I'm going to be honest, he broke me. He broke me. He broke. And then I was like, no, this isn't right. It's just not right. There's a bunch of old white guys trying to silence me. And I'm just here to say that's wrong. It's just unbelievable. I mean, where to begin? <laughs> Kathy Griffin isn't particularly talented or amusing, so in a way she does have a point. It's a little disproportionate for all of us to heap so much attention on someone who probably shouldn't be famous in the first place. So why are we doing this segment? Well, because whether she realizes it or not, and I'd bet money she has no idea, Griffin is an important figure in American life in that she's the perfect embodiment of what the modern left believes. Consider carefully what she said today. Griffin publicly fantasizes violently about murdering the president, yet she holds a press conference to announce she's the one who's been wronged. Trump and his family bullied her, she says, so have unnamed older white guys who have, as a group have oppressed her despite giving her a series of very high paying jobs. In other words, she's the real victim here. Of course she is. Liberals are always the victims. Being the victim is virtually what it means to be a member of progressive America. Victimhood has more benefits, it turns out, than AAA, and it's free. It means never having to say you're sorry. It also means being right even when you're wrong. Victimhood is the modern equivalent of holiness. It excuses anything. That's why liberals will say almost anything, no matter how ludicrous, to get it. Do you remember when President Obama, then the most powerful human being in history, used to imply that he was somehow the victim of racial bias? Did you catch Hillary Clinton the other day? A woman so rich and pampered she hasn't driven her own car in 30 years complained that sexism prevented her from becoming even richer and more pampered. Before you laugh, remember that overpaid sports figures make these kinds of claims all the time. So do entertainers and embarrassingly even TV anchors and now even third-rate unfunny comedians. We see a trend here because there is one. Wait, if the most powerful and richest people on the planet can be victims, who can't be a victim? Good question. The most remarkable thing about victimhood is that it allows the alleged victims to commit the very offenses they are complaining about. They'll punch you in the face and accuse you of assault, or more specifically, smash you in the head with a bike lock and then complain you're making them feel unsafe. They'll crush a Bible club at a school they've never even been to, then tell you that other people's beliefs oppress them. They'll take over a college campus, forcing spineless administrators to enact every one of their demands, and then claim to be powerless victims of a climate of racism. In the name of pluralism, they'll conduct nationwide witch hunts for Christian-owned small businesses trying to shut them down if they don't violate their own faith. They'll throw illiterate refugees into catch-strapped public schools and call you a bigot for questioning it, all while they flee to $50,000 a year private schools for their own kids. And of course, they'll fly private even as, even as they berate you for destroying the world with your SUV. It used to be that the point of running a country was to make things better for the people who lived there. That has changed. Now the goal, and it's almost explicit, it was to achieve moral superiority over the population, often while making their lives worse. It's quite a trick, and victimhood makes it possible. 
Ann Coulter is a writer and a thinker and nobody's victim. She's also about twice as funny as Kathy Griffin, and she joins us now. So victimhood is like a magical elixir that makes any kind of behavior possible, justifies any kind of overreach or cruelty. It's like the perfect it's the perfect tool. Yes, and when, that was the theme of my book, Guilty, how victims had turned themselves into the aggressors and they, thereby went around creating other victims. And victims are the biggest bullies in the country now. If you claim victimhood status, you have to reach out, leap out ahead and claim he who claims offense first wins. Um, but it's really gotten so much more extreme, um, particularly with Trump. Um, particularly with global warming. It's just become this druidical religion of the left. Um, although it was great, I, lo I love seeing the clips from Kathy Griffin's press conference today. I noticed that none of the networks showed it, whereas Fox News carried it live. <laughs> you well, but it was, well just, it was just, I mean, part of it was you couldn't turn away. Right. It had a car crash quality to it. But it was so revealing of a mindset and a worldview and Lisa Bloom kind of standing behind her, of course, <laughs> needless to say, because her mom wasn't available, I guess, Gloria Allred. But she betrayed no sense of self-consciousness when at a news conference to apologize <laughs> for this act of rhetorical violence, she all sweeping about herself. Yes, 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 and said that this is the first time um, anyone's been attacked by a president. Maybe she hasn't heard of, you know, Kathleen Willey, Paula Jones, Linda Tripp. Matt Drudge was the first person sued by someone working in a White House. Um, no, of course people have been attacked by White House, and I don't think it's an attack for it for Trump just to comment that his 10-year-old son had seen that disgusting image that wasn't funny and wasn't interesting, and oh, she was just so smug and thought it was so funny. Well, one of our favorite reporters here, James Rosen, got surveilled by the last right. administration. Now, the, the, the person I felt saddest for, in addition to just all 325 million Americans having to watch <laughs> this, was Kathy Griffin's mom, and apparently she has a mom, and she's not in step with her daughter. Here's what Kathy Griffin said about her at the press conference. Fox News ain't got nothing on me. Although I think you should know, my mother, who thinks Fox News is real, is not speaking to me because she's in love with Tucker Carlson. <laughs> so I'm even in trouble with my mother. So don't worry, everyone hates me. I don't want to be mean, but you think that's the real reason her mother's not speaking to her? I actually couldn't hear that. Oh. What did she say? <laughs> she, said, she said that her mom watches this show. And it's made her your so show? mad, yes, that she won't Everybody talk to Kathy. Everybody watches your show. How about that? But, I mean, imagine <laughs> if you were Kathy Griffin's parents, wouldn't, or not her parents, I don't want to be mean, someone around Kathy Griffin, you imagine would say, look, you know, you're a good person, I like you. Don't continue to humiliate yourself in public. Does nobody have people they can <laughs> no, listen to? No, partic and particularly doing that, we were all, all wondering. I mean, she must have had, and now we see there's a whole video of I mean, photographers, makeup artists, and there was no one to say this isn't a good idea. Right. It's not funny. It's really disgusting. We have actual beheadings going on, not only around the world. We always hear about them in Syria. No, who, who pioneered videotaping beheadings? Mexico, of course, um, right on our southern border. But we can't talk about that. Um, no, the left has really... They're, 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 we need a new word for Orwellian. Orwellian is just lack of self-awareness. Here's the example that has been jumping out all day. Okay, so President Trump announces America's withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement yesterday. And the rhetoric on cable television got so overheated that fire alarms likely went off in studios all over the city of New York. <laughs> Here's a representative selection of what happened. Watch. What happened yesterday on the climate issue it's an embarrassment to a country, and it should be an embarrassment to him personally for how he answers to his grandchildren. People are going to die. Uh, habitat will be destroyed. Seas will rise. Insects will spread. We have much present this psychological trouble in this way since at least Richard Nixon. So obviously some of the most successful people in the world are highly upset about this, and almost none of them have bothered to explain what's actually in the Paris deal, though. But they assure us that deal is the solution to the single gravest threat this planet has ever faced, rising levels of atmospheric CO2. They're dead serious about that. You can tell by the outrage looks on their faces and the purple <laughs> rhetoric. But hold on a minute. Can we really be sure that these people take carbon emissions seriously? Well, to find out, we compared what they say to how they live. The rule being don't watch, listen. Or don't listen, watch. It's always much more revealing. So let's start with billionaire retailer Richard Branson. He says fossil fuels are dangerous, and he calls Trump's decision, quote, America first, Earth last. Now, on the other hand, Branson owns a DeSalt Falcon 50 EX private jet. It burns more fuel on a single flight to Maui than you're going to go through in a lifetime of trips to the shore. Elon Musk, meanwhile, is mad about global warming, too, yet he flies around in a Gulfstream G650 ER. 
Bill Gates says he's deeply concerned, yet he still commutes in a $62 million Bombardier BD700 Global Express. Can you imagine the gas mileage that gets? <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio says Trump's move threatens, quote, the livability of our planet. And yet DiCaprio flew a private jet 4,000 miles from Cannes, France to New York to accept a climate award and then flew back privately. Hillary Clinton tweeted that Trump's pullout was, quote, a historic mistake that leaves American workers and families behind. And yet, speaking of workers and their families, there probably weren't a lot of those on board last year when Hillary used a private jet to fly 20 miles from Martha's Vineyard to Nantucket for a fundraiser, a critical fundraiser. Also, it's a little rich for Clinton to tout the needs of the planet on the very same day today that a new email was revealed showing she once requested a separate private plane from Michelle Obama to fly to Betty Ford's funeral. And of course, there's the former President Barack Obama, who for whatever reason never seems to get the credit the awesome hypocrisy he displays so deserves. Obama told us just yesterday that Trump's refusal to take CO2 emissions seriously could, quote, crush future generations. And yet, here's some of what he has done just since January. On the day he left office, Obama took a Marine helicopter to a government-owned 747. He flew that across the country to Palm Springs, California. <laughs> After a few days of relaxing at an 11,000 square foot mansion, can you imagine the air conditioning required for that? The electricity bill, unbelievable. He flew then on Richard Branson's private plane to the Caribbean, then he got on a private boat that took him to Branson's private island. He later left on a private jet and took another <laughs> private jet to Tahiti in the French Polynesia. After that trip wrapped up, he took another private jet to Milan, where a 14-car caravan escorted him to a conference where he spoke about, brace yourselves, global warming. Leaving open the question, how much does he, how much do any of these people really care about carbon emissions, Ann Coulter? <laughs> that is so fantastic. No, but I mean, like, what is that even, I mean, how can that even be? I know. No, I know. And it isn't like the hypocrisy that conservatives can sometimes be caught with. We know we're all sinners. Sometimes Christian conservatives aren't yeah, yeah. going to live up to that. But it's these things you can't say, oh, I slipped. When a televangelist gets caught doing something immoral, they cry and they apologize. Maybe they do it again. Maybe it's hypocrisy. I'm not defending it. But it's not but a there's voluntary. A recognition. This would be like your Christian conservative running a brothel as his job. And then not apologizing for it. And saying, I bought brothel op, op, you know, offsets <laughs> to make it okay. Right. And we've been being to, exactly we've been being told since well uh, only by Al Gore since 1992 that if we don't act instantly instantly the planet will be it's a catastrophe it'll be over I mean this shows how long ago was that movie the day after tomorrow that has to at least be a decade old um, you know when Jake Gyllenhaal was hiding yeah. in the New York Public Library but we didn't do any of this stuff so it's um, you know 30 years with Al Gore it's 10 years from the day after tomorrow and nothing ever seems to happen that that's why lots of us in America don't believe this global but, but warming. But let's say, but, but they don't believe it either. They don't believe they it don't either. Believe this it. proves they don't believe so it So what's it, Look, I'm not uh, questioning climate science. I'm not even weighing in on that. I'm merely saying if you tell us that CO2 right. emissions are destroying the world and you're flying a private jet, it's obviously not about CO2 emissions for you. What is it really about? Oh, power control, keeping the little people down. They want us to live like Drew. And it's part of their Druidical religion because they don't have a real religion. Huh. I, That's you know, I'm beginning so to think you're right. For those of you who, who follow my Twitter feed closely, you know that what I really care about is Donald Trump building the wall. But after the Paris Accord thing yesterday, I was watching TV because I was packing and it was so hilarious. And I realized it really is a religion for them. He has challenged their religion. I know. He's an apostate <laughs> and they want to burn him. And culture, thank you for that. Thank you.